I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> You're supposed to feel good in church, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but my feelings have just been kind of up and down in recent days. Um, in these days of pandemic, questionable elections, new political administrations, riots, uprisings, censorship, being unsure and even fearful about our future. We may come to the place in our thinking when we truly ask, what can I do? What can I really do about this? What can Christian people really do about it all? Uh, I'll be honest with you, that's what I've been asking. Uh, And I'm thankful that we have the Bible, the Word of God, which is uh, God's inexhaustible Word to us, His message to us. And I'm glad that the Bible is a living book, that it continues to live, and that it's able to minister to our needs and give us the... uh, comfort, give us the courage, give us uh, what we need to get through whatever we're going through. And I'm thankful that God was faithful as I was uh, reading my quiet time this past week in the book of Colossians to speak to me personally through a passage that I've read many times, but this time it just seemed to click. It just seemed to make a difference to me. And, And so much so I just posted the verse on my Facebook page because I wanted all my friends to read it as well. Uh, In answering the question, what can I do about what's happening around me? Uh, We need to acknowledge, first of all, what we cannot do. And and to be honest with you, that's what I've been dwelling on, what I can't do, what I can't do. I mean, since March of last year, what I can't do, where I can't go, what I can't wear, what I have to wear, all those kind of things. And it's really... uh, um, unsettling uh, to the point that some you know have totally lost hope and the, the rate of suicide has been out the roof since uh, this pandemic uh, and then combine that with the uh, uh, uncertainty of things surrounding the election how it happened whether or not the votes were stolen you know, all those things uh, I mean if you watch the news you are uh, left with a feeling of bewilderment and a, a fear of what may happen in the future. And then the riots that took place on our capital was uh, disgusting. And it was uh, unbelievable <laughs> to me. I don't believe it's ever happened. And how do you respond to that? What can you really do about that? So God answered my question from his word and revealed to me what I can do. It's found in the book of Colossians, if you'll Take your Bibles there and turn to Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. That's how it goes. Uh, Colossians, the fourth chapter, and verses 2 through 6 is what really got my attention when I read it in my quiet time this week. By the way, quiet time, if you're following along, uh, is is going to be in the book of Esther starting today. And so uh, if you want to know more about that, just ask me. I'll be happy to give you those passages. Colossians 4, verse 2, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which... I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. When I read this passage, the Lord reminded me that Paul is writing from prison. He was actually under house arrest when he wrote this uh, prayer. And as he, 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 he was writing to a church that he never had visited before. Uh, he never preached in Colossae. Uh, and so I did some background investigation and found some historical truth that was a blessing and, and an encouragement as well. Uh, as Paul was preaching in Ephesus for about three years, 
there was a man who came from Colossae who heard the message of the gospel and was saved. His name was Epaphras. He was from Colossae. And Epaphras went home to his home, you know, uh, a city, and he began to share what he had received. And he ultimately started the church in Colossae and was the minister there for some time. When Paul was writing this letter to the church at Colossae, Epaphras was actually with him. If you read in the text here, he was actually alongside of him. Now, whether he was there for a visit, you know, to, uh, uh, to get some advice from Paul, or whether he was, had actually been arrested, and it was in jail too. It's not clear. I just know that over in the book of Philemon, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, Paul, in reference to him, considered Epaphras to be his, quote, fellow prisoner. So at one point or another, Epaphras was in prison, uh, whether he was there when Paul was writing this letter as a prisoner or as a visitor, we just don't know. But... Uh, when I thought about the fact that, that Paul was in prison when he wrote these words, I'm asking myself, what could he do? What could he really do about the situation? He was in prison. And in, in some ways, you know, it's similar to where some of us feel we are right now. We feel we, we can't do anything. Before, we were told, well, just pray and vote. We prayed and vote. And still there's speculation as to whether or not our vote was truly counted. And, and so we come to the place where Paul was in a sense. We're not in prison literally. We still have some freedoms, thank God, in this country. But in some ways we feel absolutely helpless as to what we can do about anything. What can we do? What can I do? Well, Paul couldn't do anything by himself. He couldn't come and go as he pleased. Paul was on total lockdown. Everywhere he went, he was with some guards. He couldn't do anything. But I want you to notice something. He did not give up in despair. He could do something. And he did what he could do. What can we do when the thoughts which so easily get us down are all related to what we cannot do? Where we cannot go, what we cannot change, what we cannot say. We can do what he did. We can pray. That's one thing that we can do. In verse 2, he says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Verses 2 to 4, interestingly, is really not a prayer that Paul prayed for others. It's actually a prayer that he asked them to pray for him. It, it's actually a prayer request that he made of his readers in, in the church at Colossae. I, I believe that he loved these people because he had seen how Epaphras, one that he led to Christ himself, went back and applied what he learned and taught other people the gospel and people were being saved. That's always exciting, isn't it? To the point that he started a church in his own town. And so that was in a sense Paul's church because Paul preached to Epaphras. That's how the gospel goes around. That's a wonderful thing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Sharing what Christ teaches us. So that others are saved. And in turn they share what Christ teaches them. So this sermon comes from a prayer request that Paul made for himself. And from it we learn what we can do, what we can really do to change our perspective and ultimately change our world. According to George Barna, who is one who's for years done research and, and surveys and asked people's opinions on things, he says that almost 90% of Americans say they pray. Over 60% of unchurched Americans say they pray. Of the unchurched Americans, one in three believe that prayer makes a difference in their lives. Among born-again respondents, nearly 70% say that God personally answers 
their prayers. Would you say that God personally answers your prayers when you pray? Here's my question. Are you praying? Did you know that nearly 1,400 verses in the Bible speak about prayer? And this sermon isn't specifically about the subject of prayer, but it's hard to read that passage and not realize where it came from. It was a prayer. It is prayer. He basically asked the people in Colossae to pray for him. And friends, I want to remind you, it's a great time, especially in these days, to pray for spiritual leaders. Pray for your pastor. Pray for missionaries on the field that represent America in, in some respects. I know talking to my daughter, the people in Poland are, are very sad that President Trump did not win. They're very sad. They loved President Trump in Poland. It's amazing. They love him in Poland and hate him in America. But it's because they, they see that he, he's a strong leader and he's done some good things for America. But this isn't a political speech. Although um, politics should be a subject that we're concerned about. You know why? Because what policymakers do ultimately affects our ability to share the gospel. You understand that? And there, there's a great tide in our country that's swelling against Christianity, against the Christian message. And there's some in high places of authority that are helping that tide against Christianity. So um, this is not the same America that it was in the 1950s, in the 1960s, even in the 1970s when it came to how people in our country view Christians. Just something to think about. And so what can I do about it? I can pray. In fact, he says continue in prayer. And that be devoted to prayer. Uh, continue, he says, or persist in prayer. The word continue means devote yourselves to prayer. Grab a hold of something and not let it go. Devote yourselves. To devote yourself to prayer means to hang on no matter what happens. You never give up on prayer, even when it seems useless. In Luke chapter 18, verse number 1, the Lord Jesus said this. He says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up, not to stop. Paul says, keep at it. Continue in prayer. And then he says, be watchful. Be watchful in prayer. Verse 2 says, watch in the same. It means to stay awake. And that's good advice for prayer and also for sermon listening on Sunday mornings. Stay awake. You might miss something really important. You say, well, I just can't stay awake. I was up till 3 o'clock in the morning. Why didn't you get to bed earlier? Why didn't you prepare for the Lord's day? Anyways, devote yourself. Keep at it, but be watchful in prayer. And it's a call for an earnestness in our prayer. It's the opposite of sleepiness or laziness or coldness or indifference. It's actually thinking through your prayers and being consistent, watchful in your prayers. If you need to, write it down. Make a prayer list. Go by the prayer list that you want to pray for others. Have you ever wondered why we often bow our heads and close our eyes when we pray? Did you know that that's not in the Bible? No, you don't have to close your eyes and, and bow your head in prayer, especially if you're driving down the road. Don't bow your head and close your eyes. But, but why is it that we bow our heads and close our eyes? Because we don't want to be distracted by what's around us. That's really the reason. In fact, if you study prayer in the Bible, you'll find that men and women throughout the ages have prayed in various ways. Some men prayed standing up with their hands lifted up to heaven and their eyes wide. Some prayed laying on their face on the ground. Some prayed kneeling. And so there, there are various ways 
that we can pray. But the reason most people bow their head and close their eyes, I can't say most people, the reason people bow their head and close their eyes is because they don't want to be distracted. Have you ever noticed that when you actually decide you're going to pray, and you go in a room and you begin praying, have you ever noticed that the phone rings or somebody knocks at the door or, or the dog starts barking outside or something there? I don't believe that that's by mistake. I believe that the Satan himself knows that prayer is probably our strongest weapon against him. And if he can distract us from praying, then he will win a lot of battles in our life. Paul is in jail. He's probably chained between two soldiers, house arrest. He can't do anything, but he can pray. I wonder what that must have been like to be one of those soldiers chained to him while he was praying. I mean, he was a giant. He's praying in front of those. I wonder if he prayed out loud on purpose. Bet you he did. Anyways, he says, be watchful in prayer because someone doesn't want you to pray. Sometimes it seems as if the devil's best work comes when we decide to pray. James 5.16 speaks about the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous people. It says they avail much. The effectual, fervent, boiling prayers. That doesn't happen by accident. That's something that happens because we persist and that we know the importance and the value of prayer. Paul said, please pray for me. Continue in prayer. When you can't do anything, you can pray. Be watchful in prayer. And he says, be thankful in prayer. The NIV NIV renders it, be watchful and thankful in prayer. Eugene Peterson, the one who comprised the message version, says it like this, stay alert with your eyes wide open in gratitude when you pray. Gratitude is the doorway to every spiritual blessing. Why would God give you more if you're not thankful for what you already have? If we don't know what else to do when we pray, we can always find reasons to be thankful. Someone has said there are only two basic prayers, and each one is only one word. The first prayer is help. The second prayer is thanks. We can always be thankful. So what can we do when we feel so restricted so uh, powerless, in some cases so hopeless, we can pray. He says continue in prayer. And then the second thing that I noticed as a general principle when I read this passage is that you can focus on the needs of others during these days. Paul was thinking of folks that he had never met before, but but, but people that he loved and in whom he wanted to see spiritual growth. He wanted to know how they were doing. He wanted to encourage them. That's why he wrote the letter of Colossians. It was meant to be read aloud in the assembly. And I noticed near the end of it, he made mention of one one fellow by the name of Archippus. Near the end of the letter, he says, by, by the way, he says, make sure that you read this letter in the churches of uh, Laodicea. Uh, and, and, and make sure that you read it for Archippus. Remind him to be faithful to his calling. If you know anything about Laodicea, if you read the letters in Revelation, the letters to the church, one of them was the letter to Laod- the church at Laodicea, and the problem that Christ had with that church was that they were lukewarm. Uh, they were not s- stirred up about the Lord. They were just kind of complacent lukewarm you know in, in their in their faith and and the bible actually says it, it made christ sick when he thought about them made him want to spew, spew them out of, out of his mouth because of their lukewarmness he said i would rather you be cold or hot but not lukewarm well archippus evidently was the pastor of that church so i thought thought that was kind of interesting when he says make sure that you read this letter 
to the churches in Laodicea. They were right next to Colossae, by the way. And, and make sure that you remind Archippus of the calling that's on his life. Gives me the impression that it's possible that if a church is lukewarm, the pastor may have something to do with it. It's convicting when I read that. But what is he doing? He's chained between two soldiers. He's praying. And he's asking for prayer. And, and the, the whole reason he writes this letter is because he's focusing on others. Focusing on, on others. He wrote letters to others. He prayed for others. He asked them to pray for him. He even sent some helpers to the church. Now this is something that he was doing out of a, out of a prison. When we think we can't do anything about it, this is huge. He was praying. He was writing letters. I wonder if there's anyone that you can write a letter to this week that would encourage them in your walk with the Lord. A card, an email, a message on Facebook. Colossians 4, verses 7 through 9. This is in the same chapter. Look at it. It says, uh, All of my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose. What purpose? To minister, to know your estate, to comfort your hearts. And then he says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So because he was con you know, concerned about others, it would have been really easy to focus on himself, wouldn't it? And when you and I are in situations like we're facing these days, it's really easy to focus on ourselves. And that, that can be very dis discouraging. Very depressing. We think what we what what it used to be like. What I can't do now. I'm I'm unsure what it's going to look like in the future. I'm scared in some in some ways. And I'm focusing on me. But in the midst of this terrible thing that he was going through, he was focusing on others. He's sending them a letter. He was praying for them. He was asking them to join him in his ministry and pray for him. And he was even sending helpers. He sent Tychicus for the purpose of encouraging them, comforting them. And then he sent Onesimus. What do you know about Onesimus? Onesimus was actually a runaway slave. In, the, in those days, it was a common practice that people actually had slaves. And Onesimus was a runaway, and his owner was a believer. And his owner's name was Philemon. Onesimus ran away to Rome. Somehow he ended up in prison with Paul. And Paul was able to minister to him. He trusted Christ as his Savior. And the whole book of Philemon, the purpose of it, is a letter that Paul writes to his owner saying, will you receive him back? He's one of us now. I love it. I love it. Don't you? Paul actually led him to the Lord. Philemon chapter 1 verse 10. He led him to the Lord. And then he, now he wants to send him back home. He says, you're from Colossae. You're one of you. You're one of them. He was not thinking about himself in prison. He was thinking about other people. That's what we can do when we can't do anything. We can think about others. Who does God want you to reach out to? During these days. Who haven't you seen in the several months. That you need to reach out to. Write a letter. Send a card. Give them a phone call. Send them a Facebook message. With one of those funny memes on it. Memes. That says. How are you? Dan sends one sometimes. It's of a, a llama. Just, just checking on you. It's encouraging. Focus on the needs of others. Um, but then number three, 
seek open door opportunities. Verses 3 and 4 in the text says, With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, which for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. In the Greek, this is literally a door of the word. The concept of open, open doors in the New Testament almost always has to do with new opportunities to spread the gospel. It was Paul's great desire that he would be able to give the good news and make it manifest or make it clearly shown, make it maybe understandable. The idea is that Christ himself is the one who opens doors of opportunities. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, And to the angel, the messenger, the the pastor of the church of Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. God is able to open doors of opportunities to utter, speak, share the gospel. You know what the gospel is, right? It's the good news. How many of you need some good news? Too much bad news around here. You know that there are opportunities that God would open up for you to speak about the gospel. If he knew, you would walk through the door. That's important. If he knew, you would walk through the door. Throughout these days of uncertainty, God can open doors for us to share some good news if he knows we'll take advantage of them. Paul's prayer, he says, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me that... that God will open a door of utterance so that I could share the mystery, the mystery of the gospel and make it plain, make it understandable. That's a prayer that, that I wish folks would pray for me every time I preach the gospel, that I would be able to have an open door to utter the word and that I can make it plain understandable, applicable to people's lives. Preaching is more than just a theological study. It should be theologically based. But if it's theologically based, but it's not shown to apply to people's life, then they walk away with a theological knowledge, but they don't know how it applies to their life. That, That truly is what... I want to emphasize when I preach, not just to give theological truth, but to be able to show people that listen how it how it affects their own lives. First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Wow, we can sure apply that today. Are you ready? Are you praying for opportunities to share the mystery of the gospel with others? They abound. They're all around us if we're just ready when God opens the door. Look for, seek after opportunities that God opens for you to speak about the good news of the gospel. I don't believe that Christians should be a part of the tearing down of other people. Going to the next point, we should walk wisely before the world. In verse verse 5, it says, walk in wisdom. Toward them that are without, that is, those who know not the Lord, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, 
seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Paul is directly speaking to Christian people here. Now, they were not living in so nice times either. You remember who, who was in charge in those days? Rome. Rome was never known to be nice to Christian people. He said, listen, folks, you, you need to walk with wisdom in front of the world. You need wisdom. And you need to be careful what you say and how you say it. It's important for believers not to get on this bandwagon, either outwardly or even on social media, going against everything. We need to be for something. If, if we're speaking out, we need to be speaking with grace, understanding that not everyone sees things the way we do. He, he made a point to say in front of those without, those lost people. What do lost people think about Christians? I'm reading a book that my daughter gave me for Christmas. It's called Evangelism as Exiles. Life in Mission as Strangers in Our Own Land by uh, 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 Elliot Clark. He's the writer of it. It's really a good read. Um, on my second, I'm going to read it two times at least. Based on the book of First Peter in the, in the New Testament. But I'm reminded when I read the passage here of another passage in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians 5 verse 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. You may not agree with what is happening around us or what people are saying around us. But be careful and be wise what you say and how you say it. Again, pointing back, it says, let your speech be always with grace. Grace. Seasoned with salt. That is, say something that you want to stick. You don't want it to, to go away. You season something back in those days to keep it from going bad. Salt was a seasoning. Season the words that you say. Be wise what you say and in fact, sometimes we shouldn't say anything. We should just pray. This we can do. We can do this. Colossians 4 and verse number 5. No, verse number 2. Continue in prayer. And watch in the same with thanksgiving. I can do that. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. See the price that Paul paid for preaching truth? He was in bonds. I wonder if it meant being arrested and put in prison would our message change? Would your message change? <clears throat> Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time means not letting it waste. It means making every uh, opportunity, um, seeing the value in that opportunity and not wasting time. Walk wisely before the world. This we can do. So if you're thinking like I was thinking this week that there's nothing I can do, this will prove you wrong. There is something you can do. So let's apply this truth this week. Let's do these things. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have to come to you freely and be able to come directly to the throne of God because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who made it possible for us to be part of your family, to have access to your very throne. And we come to you in His name because we have no name of our own. 
And we praise you and we lift you up and you, we adore you today for what you've made possible. Father, we're not the only people that have felt powerless. But we're reminded today that the one who lives in us is greater than he that is in the world. And I pray that we would do exactly what Paul was doing. There would be people of prayer consistently pray even when we don't see answers that we'll continue to pray about these things that Satan tries to use to rob us of our joy help us to be reminded that we have no future except in you you're literally holding the world together help us to be encouraged Lord to, to, to know that we're on your side and you're on our side Help us to focus on the needs of those around us so that we don't become so self-centered we end up in depression and discouragement and despair. Help us to be observant and seek opportunities to share the good news with folks around us knowing that we are strangers, pilgrims, even aliens in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. It's not here. We're just here for a short time. Help us, Lord, to redeem the time and make best use of it for your kingdom. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Lord bless you all. We'll see you Wednesday, if you can make it. Part, well, actually, we'll see you tonight. Yeah, I hope you can make it tonight. <laughs>